Coming up on Double Feature, what is happening with the donations? Tune in to find out this time on Double Feature. Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom? My name is Eric. With me is expert on all things feature, Michael Kester. Hey, how are you? Michael Kester, I have done something terrible that I want to tell you about. What's that? Uh, we have two movies coming up uh-huh. this time. Uh, what are the movies? We're doing Tremors and The Fog. John Carpenter's The Fog. Well, you can't just John Carpenter's The Fog and then be like, oh, and some people who made Tremors, because that kind of short sells Tremors. Well, I wanted, I just wanted to specify that it wasn't the shitty remake. Oh, yeah, the new remake. So uh, that is a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, it does. Ah, poor Maggie Grace. Anyways, the terrible thing I did the other day, and the reason this will be such a fantastic double feature, have you heard of Alice in Wonderland? The... Which it's the, the, story? the new thing that came out with the the mime face paint makeup and which the, version the, the Tim Burton oh and the, yeah yeah that was fucking terrible yeah that's a rough that's I watched rough that ride. yesterday and I didn't think I'd be able to continue doing a weekly show about movies after that yeah that was a, that was a, that was not a fun time so soulless and crushing and I just oh. but now we have Tremors in the Fog that's which right. by comparison. If I make these movies sound as if they are the two greatest films ever created, now you have uh, you have some knowledge as to why that is. Right. Well, what was the idea of pairing up Tremors in the Fog? I think we were kind of trying to pair up uh, environmental danger. <laughs> our, of- our type, the the double feature type of environmental. No, yeah. fuck this 2012 stuff. Yeah. This is environmental disaster at Absolutely. its finest. Or is it? And that's something we'll talk about. Um, and we're going to spoil both of these disaster films. We're going to spoil Tremors, so if you haven't seen that, skip right on over to The Fog. And uh, you know what? If you haven't seen The Fog, then skip, I don't know, back to Tremors and listen to it again. You can use the chapters menu to do that because there's chapters, of course. And those are accessible from all sorts of various Apple and Windows devices, but still not the Zune, unfortunately. Sorry, Zune. So we begin with Tremors. And uh, Tremors marks the return of the lazy Sunday afternoon movies on Double Feature. Yeah. This was uh, a staple of season one of our show. Yeah. yeah. And it went away during season two, probably because we found more legitimate films that right. we didn't catch on TBS, the Superstation. Uh-huh. Or, but it's TNT that's the lazy TNT Sunday afternoon. TNT and WGN, one. if you're a network baby. Oh, like is that I what was. that is? Yeah. Yeah, I don't actually remember because I never sat down to watch lazy Sunday movies. I just walked into a room exactly. when they were on. What defines these movies? I, you know, I think... Have we talked about one in specific before, or have we just mentioned that this is a, a phenomena that exists? Gremlins. Gremlins was one, Gremlins sure. Gremlins is yeah. definitely one. I think uh, Child's Play kind of has a vibe there. Yeah, some of those. Yeah, it's, some of those. It's, 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 or it's usually, certainly more than the other usually, slashers do. like, Gremlins is a great example, and Tremors is another great example. It's usually these horror movies that aren't scary, right? And they're family yeah, friendly, and right. the villain is the villain is equal parts cute and <laughs> evil. Okay, all right. You know, but I kind of got that feeling from um, House of a Thousand Corpses a little bit. Yeah, there's it a turned vibe into there. a little yeah. monster stuff at the end too, and I'm not, I'm still not sure why it felt like that. It might be the kind of thing where I can turn off mentally a little bit. Yeah. And what's being presented to me is very visual and conceptual. And you just feel like you're uh, you're part of that. Yeah. Tremors is the kind of thing where you just identify as one of the townspeople. Yeah. You're one of the townspeople and you're trying to get through this thing. And uh-huh. that's what's going on there. Uh, but I, you know what? I don't think House of a Thousand Corpses did that. I'm going to treat House of a Thousand Corpses as the anomaly uh-huh. as to why I don't understand the uh, the lazy sunday afternoon film but all right so i i think you hit on a couple things i think it's safe yeah i think there's you know a lot of times it's monsters yeah it's visual but it's got to be something that's going to keep you watching the screen right because if it's a bunch of people talking you're going to walk out you're going to get yourself another bag of chips forget what you were watching right. and end up standing out on your front stoop right well and part of it is the uh, the kind of quality that you can drop in and drop out mm-hmm. Um, of the films we so consistently call great films on the show 
are not films that you can just walk into, watch a scene, oh, that was nice, and walk out. Yeah. But a movie like Tremors, it's about surviving. It's you constantly come in, about you... staying away from the graboids. Right. Not called Tremors. No, not by the, the way. Tremors. Now, a mistake that I'm sure I will make all the time well, because that's, that's just as the long kind as of before thing. That... I jump the gun on you and say that we here on Double Feature acknowledge that the creatures are called graboids and that they, in fact, create tremors in the ground. Absolutely. The tremor is the effect, not the creature itself. But you know what I mean. You're surviving with these characters. So you come in and they're shooting up some graboids, not some tremors. And, uh, and then you, you know, you head off to your kitchen, you make a sandwich and then you come back and they're shooting some more and that's fine. It's your survival instinct, not the, uh, not the math part of your brain that's right. working during a film exactly. like Tremors. So I was trying to put my finger on what this film was as I started watching it for the first time. And at first, you know, the, the grapes of wrath thing is kind of yeah. prevalent. You yeah. feel, but maybe because they're driving the truck around, it's got all well, this stuff they're, in it. They're hard up for money and yeah, you know, right. they're doing odd jobs. They're kind of just doing, making ends meet the right. entire time. So at first I was thinking, all right, so we have grapes of wrath meets critters. That's what's going Pretty on much. here. But then I started thinking it's really Dukes of Hazard with sandworms. Yeah. That seemed more that, and maybe that's part of the lazy Sunday mm-hmm. quality of it. Um, but you have these characters who, uh, what, how do you describe a group of characters like that? It's, it's just a, it's a bunch of stereotypes. Yeah. It's a bunch of film stereo. It's, it's essentially all the B characters that never get any That's screen what, yep. time. Yeah. They're in all your B characters. It's, this is their village. They yep. all actually live in Perfection Valley and then they drive out to these other films you've seen them in. It's the sexual harassment panda episode of South Park, the uh, land of misfit mascots. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's all the B movie stars or something from Super Beasto that we mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of saw that uh that bar where they all all the monsters kind of come together and you have a lot of the b-movie stars right but tremors was a lot more southern than i thought yeah. it would be it has this sort of southern rock quality to yep. it um if you just wanted to talk about the two characters who are in the grapes of wrath truck i mean what kind of because i i have a hard time figuring out them you know where that what that is besides dukes of hazard right. that's well, just always have, my go-to for you that you have kevin bacon who plays the hot shot shooting from the hip right never has a plan guy yeah. and then you have the older wiser always has a plan guy sure those i mean that's it it's it's kind of the why are you always such a hot shot i know what i'm doing and i mean obviously you know that right. the hot shot will come through in the end with the plan that is my favorite part of the film easily those are our two characters who in any other film would be henchmen yeah they would be Absolutely. bumbling henchmen is what they would yep. be but there is a sort of camaraderie between them, uh, almost something like out of Serenity. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's almost like they're they're traveling across and, the fucking galaxy together. But they're together begrudged they, to be yes. together the whole yeah, right. time. Like they're it's kinda, an assignment. Yeah, they're, yeah. Stuck in a, they're stuck in a boat. Right. Which isn't the case at all. They're, it's not like they have a real assignment that puts them together. It's just that there's only seven people in the town. Pretty much. So, so the fact that they have to stay with one another is uh, it's essential and they still treat it. It's their own choice. But they treat it like they've been assigned that task. Mm -hmm. So aside from the country western southern harmonica, which I feel like uh, as much as the setting is, you know, it's desert and it's small town. It's also this southwestern rock stuff. It's the guitar and the harmonica that make up as much of the the setting as the local bar or the pig markets or whatever else is going on. The Asian run convenience store. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So set up perfection Valley for me. Where is this place? What is perfection Valley is in the American Southwest. It's surrounded by mountains. Right. Um, It sounds like Stepford wives perfection Valley, but that's not it at all. It's It's too dirty. It's too dusty. It's surrounded by mountains. There's maybe seven buildings in the entire town. And it's just, it's, it's compiled of everybody. It's compiled of, the typical Mexican guy, the typical Asian right, guy, right. the typical teenager who thinks he's funny, the typical hot geologist. Yes. And <laughs> Wait, <the> t- what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. So there's a hot geologist. All right. We'll come film. back to the hot geologist. Uh, but sorry, what you characters? And, you're and then finally, about. the typical, uh, you know, gunslinging duo who are right. the Y2K ready people yeah. who are ready for Y2K far before Y2K was ever a problem and <laughs> yeah. far after Y2K was never a problem. The survivalists. And that is literally not only your cast of characters, but I believe every single person who lives in the There's town. There's a little girl in a pogo stick. Yeah, yeah, the little girl in the pogo stick is the only other person who exists in this town who, uh, you know, but she still gets screen time. Yep. She gets her little moments here and there. I don't believe that there is a single character we haven't seen. I don't believe if you told me there were more, 
I would not believe that they exist. Yeah. I think everyone in the town is in this tiny group, and that's it. That's all of them. You know, it's something that reminds me uh, immediately of Maximum Overdrive. Uh, we'll talk about that on the Music Box uh, yeah. Massacre show. But that's a, you know, it's a movie where the trucks, the cars, the automobiles are uh, the antagonists against this small collective group of people. You know, the slasher movie type group mm-hmm. of people. Your group that the final girl eventually ends up right. coming from. But that's as close as this gets, really, yeah. from slasher territory. Right. Also kind of reminds me of, I know we'll be talking about John Carpenter with The Fog, but The Thing, you know, yeah. where we had that, right. we talked about that on right. the show, where we had that small group of people. Um, also, Feast, yeah. another one we hit on the yeah. show, where it's just, here's your small group of people, you want to survive against this ridiculous threat, and it's just normal, everyday people. They appear to have special skill sets, but no more than a uh you know a crashed on the island type gilgan's island kind of right. scenario where you do this and you do this and you do this we all have these tasks but well, at the end of roles. the day that's all it yeah, is it's just roles it's it's the kind of thing where if we were uh if we were taking a bus downtown and the bus got stranded in some kind of apocalyptic scenario somehow everyone on the bus would have some profession that is incredibly relevant to this mm-hmm. the apocalyptic scenario we now found ourselves exactly. in exactly but then there's also this side of it that kind of feels like Big Trouble in Little China yeah. just because of how ridiculous it is and how underprepared the time. It, sure. It's almost like if you stop to think about Tremors for too long, you would realize that there must be some simple fix to the situation. Yeah. But uh, there isn't because we don't have time for that. Yeah. We just got to keep going with the resources at hand. It's not what's the perfect tool for this job. It's here's a bunch of tools we have. Let's throw them at the exactly. sandworms until something <laughs> sticks. So among this cast of characters is the new geologist in town. Right. Uh, can we talk about Just So Happens? Well, the geologist is the perfect example of Just So Happens. Yeah. Tremor is, is I mean, Tremor is the definition of a perfect storm as far as the storyline goes. Mm-hmm. Everything that happens in Tremors is a it's a it's just a series of perfect coincidences yep. and we, which we have titled just so happens because you know just so happens there's a truck trailer over there next to my tractor yep just so happens a geologist came into town that can read a seismograph yeah a seismograph right so we have some pig farmers we have people who operate the drug store and sell you the uh you know, two dollar fizzy soda, um, and then we have the geologist, right? Who doesn't seem to belong with. Apparently, she's going to a school that doesn't actually exist within the fiction of the film, right? And she, so she's there. She just so happens to be there, and she investigates seismographs, right? It's a skill set that is so extremely particular to one thing. You almost know right then and there what Tremors is going to be about because you're handed a, hey, look at this quirky job position that mm-hmm. I have. This this very, very specific, tiny margin, the skill. What could that possibly be used for, Michael? Apparently, it's used to monitor not only the whereabouts <laughs> of the Graboids, but how many there are based on a complex analysis of when the readings went yeah. off, which is as simple as this one went off at two minutes and it was over here. <laughs> yep. And this one went off at two minutes and two seconds later and it was way, way far. Yep. There must be more than one. It turns out there's four. Yes. Uh, I'm not overwhelmed by the fact there's four of them. I still don't feel like this is much of a threat. The thing about there only being four Graboids is kind of... um it's kind of sad in the fact that you don't even find out there are four until mm-hmm. after they've killed the first one. Yes. So they kill the first one by mistake. Uh-huh. So this is a horrible setup <laughs> for your monster. Yeah. You kill one by mistake. Yeah. Whoops. And then, oh no, there's three more. Maybe if we all just run toward this canal three times. Right. Which, again, that goes back to what would be the best solution. Go back to that canal and have all four of them run into the fucking canal. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you've got to keep it interesting. You've got a bunch of characters. None of them are intelligent, which is a really strong point, except the geologist. <laughs> but she doesn't really know anything about the creatures, and she's not answering any questions. The profession, as you mentioned, of uh, a couple of these people, they the couple runs the gun shop. Right. right. It's not even a gun and, shop. It's just their fucking house. Oh, yeah. I guess it's not. It's a, <laughs> I keep thinking of it as an armory, yeah. but it's, uh, yeah, it's just their it's home. Their it's where they reside. Um, it's because in a in a town this small, you just associate everyone is, you know, living at their little convenience store. Right. Their, uh, their little beat-up shack. 
this has to be some of the worst treatment of weaponry. I yeah. Think. Well, when did we do Shotgun 101? Was that Terminator? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So we complained about the fact that uh, in movies, oftentimes the shotguns just use slugs, even though buckshot is far more common. And they use buckshot when it's convenient. They never make any distinction. We basically talked about how shotguns typically work in movies versus in, you know, versus in real life. I don't know what the most egregious thing is here. I mean, we have silence hunting rifles. Yeah. We have uh, the elephant rifle. I mean, okay. So they're shooting all the weapons from the hip. That can be forgiven in movies. But they make a big deal out of this elephant gun, right? This giant fucking shotgun of, a, of an elephant rifle, which would pretty much blow off your arms uh, uh, if you didn't it, shoot it in a way that you were, right. you were stationed you know, and they're just kind of running around, fl- shooting it from the hip with no kind of aim. Uh, it's just completely ridiculous. That whole scene, the um, there's just an awkward amount of, uh, there's an awkwardly small amount of action coming right, from right. where you first get in the arsenal scene. Yeah. Right? Because they're taking this thing out. It's busted through the wall. And you have, you know, what, what's supposed to be a badass shot mm-hmm. of all of these guns out on the wall. And they're all just making these little pop sounds, and they don't appear right. to have any kick, and they're not doing anything to the monster. Something about that scene, there's so much badassery, but at the same time, it's so incredibly weak. Right, and then eventually the monster just goes, <laughs> and it's yeah. dead. Yep. And then, then two down. I mean, you're at two down. And that scene ends in a extremely awkward celebration scene, right. where the, the celebration is almost weaker than the So gun. what ends up happening that's really strange is it comes back to the people on the roof, yeah. and... You know, it it shows each individual person's reaction, right? But it's as if they're acting like the one. <laughs> the one in particular is the dude with the with the fucking baseball cap. Yeah, he's like, all right, yeah, and right. He's swinging he's his baseball his up, right. camp at the ha- at the fucking camera. You don't believe that they're all celebrating at the same time, right? They, exactly. They drug each of the actors out in the middle of their lunch break and said, "You're going to film your celebration now, so just do something celebratory." Right. The film makes up for scenes like this uh, when it does something incredibly inventive, like when they have the car buried uh, yes. under the ground. Yes. You know, when you start unearthing that and it's the car's headlights, it's mm-hmm. it's um, buried. I guess it's buried facing up. Yeah. I, I don't even know how to talk about the orientation it of that. Pulled, because well, the, it's, uh, the graboid pulls the car from the rear yeah. into the ground. Yeah, yeah. So the car is vertical underground with the headlights at ground level. Yeah, and eventually the characters get on track, too, once they build the pipe bombs. Right. Then they kind of figure out what's going on there. Well, so right around the pipe bombs is where I I really want to talk about what I love about Tremors. Mm -hmm. And it's that most of the time you're running from the ground. Yeah. You very rarely ever see a Graboid. You only see it fully once in the, again, in the glorious ending scene, (laughs) which we'll get to very soon. Right. But I like the fact that the fear... Even though everybody's afraid of the graboids, it's an adult version of fucking hot lava from yeah. recess in second grade. Yeah, sure. Where you just don't touch the ground. Yep. You don't know why you don't touch the ground in second grade. Turns out it's because there's graboids under it. Yeah. But I just like that all of these characters have somehow divorced themselves from these monstrous beasts that have come out of nowhere and are instead preoccupied with keep your feet off the ground. Yeah, as if that makes any sense either. You know, they keep talking about sound waves. Uh, you can jump on a rock, you can jump on a house, you can, sometimes you can shout and sometimes you can't, but they, they talk about it as if shouting from the rooftop of a house would cause more vibrations than if you're jumping on top of a tiny rock. Exactly. And there's this whole thing. I mean, it it dispels the theory from when we were children, where if you're wearing shoes, that doesn't count as being on the lava because your shoes are touching. You played with a bunch of fucking cheaters. That's what happened there. Well, and that's what I like about this film is that it's very clear that if 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 the graboid can eat you from where you are, right, then you're in the wrong spot. The answer here was to just have everyone run in opposite directions. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's not a very humane answer, but by the end of the film, so many of the people have been eaten that it would have made more sense numbers wise to just say, if we all run in opposite directions, they won't catch all of us and to just completely take off. But instead what they do is they all retreat to these rocks, which the graboids can't get them on because they're deep and the graboids can't burrow through rock. The whole goal is to get to the mountains. Yeah. And so they kill one by fishing with a pipe bomb, which is it's a really smart idea. I mean, it's it's entertaining and you get a big, gory pumpkin sure. splat all over all the characters. 
But then the final the final graboid is left, and it's the the injured one that yes. tried to eat their truck. Yeah, it's kind of this weird arch enemy thing. It's a Jaws thing. The, yeah, the, the, later, the Jaws stuff where the shark has a personal vendetta. Yeah. So there's this scene where the essentially the three leads: geologist girl, Kevin Bacon, and old man friend. Yes. Because uh, I mean, in this film, characters don't need names. Old man friend. That's fine. So. They're all standing there, one pipe bomb left, and they could, Kevin Bacon could use that pipe bomb to make the monster run away, and they can safely get back to the rock where they will probably eventually starve to death. Yeah. Or, the alternative is what he comes up with. He starts fucking running, and the monster is hot on their trail, goddamn graboid smoke coming out of the sand. Yeah, this time they smoke. (laughs) And... Not always, but this time. And so he throws the pipe bomb just past the graboid mm-hmm. he misses the graboid and everybody's like you idiot that was our last pipe bomb and the bomb goes off and the graboid freaks out scared of the loud noise and speeds up and you see it come crashing <laughs> right. out of the side of this canyon only then do they realize the genius of his plan and it's just this massive fucking bus of a worm yeah that splats in a gross gory slimy finish on the rocks below and then they're saved by the plan that the guy who never comes up with a plan has put together the thing i love about those characters i mean here's kevin bacon's character who is a complete fucking moron right and in this scene we see that all of the other morons are stupider than he is <laughs> you're just operating at such a low level it's like it's like watching children you know right. it's like watching the plans that children that first year fucking students that people who have no idea what they're talking about come up with and you're just sitting back from afar going man yeah. if these people weren't so dumb they could do something right. a lot easier uh so this is kind of weird for us to talk about on the show Because Tremors, there's a lot of films in this series. Yeah. But you have desperately resisted doing a Tremors Killapalooza. Yeah. And when you say you don't want to do a Killapalooza, then I believe you. We did Children of the Corn together, but when you, Michael Kester, say no Killapalooza on this one, I I am right there behind you. But uh, tell me why. Why no Killapalooza with Tremors? I feel like, well, first off, our Killapalooza limit was originally five, and we have since rescinded it to four. But only when completely awesome right. to do so. And so... Although they're working on a fifth Tremors film. I mean, yeah, we could have waited but, it but out. remember, the fourth Tremors film is a prequel. Oh, yeah. Fuck it's that noise. It's a prequel, and it doesn't... I mean, it, it's 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 goofy, and it's fun, and it it's enjoyable, but it doesn't really ha- pack the same punch that I feel like. I feel like the first trilogy is all right, and I really enjoy that it's all made by the same three guys. It's written by the same three guys. Yeah. They alternate directly. I'm really in love with that concept that, sure. it's the, that it's a franchise child of these three men. But I feel like it kind of gets a little bit campy. I feel like the mo- the most important thing to talk about is the first film because they eventually start using CG and there's ass blasters and evolutions and it kind of gets convoluted. And what I really like is the simplicity of the first film. And I like that it's all practical effects and that a lot of the practical effects are shake the dirt up. Yeah, you know, you just uh, slid right by that one there. But when you were describing these movies to me, and you're just like, this happens and this happens and ass blasters. And I will wait, wait, hold on, <laughs> hold on, go back here. What? And uh, I thought you were you were just bullshitting me, but apparently there's really something called ass blasters. So yeah, that's fantastic. Third film, ass blasters. So what you're saying is that we would gain basically nothing by watching it, the entire yeah, franchise. They're not bad. They're enjoyable. I mean, I would I would suggest that Podmanity would watch them in their free time because they're enjoyable. But I don't think that they would bring anything to the show, and we would just be wasting a Killapalooza that we could be spending on, say, fucking Wishmaster. You know what else makes this uh, kind of in in line with some of the slasher stuff we've done? is that there is a TV series based on Tremors. So as we were watching this, we we're all kind of going, wasn't well, there some TV Tremors thing going on at some point? And unlike the Friday the 13th series, which had nothing to do with Jason, really, uh, this was closer to the Robert England TV series, Freddy's Nightmares. Right. Uh, in that it actually kind of it kept the same world and the same mythology. Apparently, it was about the cast of characters learning to live, to coexist with the graboids and and it had christopher lloyd in it from back to the future wow. <laughs> well because it was on the sci-fi channel okay. i believe that's when he was just on retainer at the sci-fi I channel gotcha. and they would just put him in right. any fucking show right. that that came on the air but uh it got kind of the firefly treatment where they aired it all fucking out of order and it didn't make any sense and I don't know if it really caught on i think it ran for a full season out of order and made everyone angry i'd watch that show 
The great thing about not doing Tremors as a Killapalooza is we can talk about a different franchise now because right. that's that's about as much Tremors as I needed is yeah. one solid film of right. Tremors. for sure. Uh, but now we have The Fog. Where is this in relation to the other John Carpenter stuff? Uh, well, it's pretty early on. It's still in the 70s. It came out yeah. in 1979, which is after Dark Star, after Halloween, after Assault on Precinct 13, but that's it. I mean, That's it's his after the film. Elvis TV movie the, as Kurt well, right? Russell, yeah. yeah. Um, and then everything after that, you know, the thing escape, basically everything we've done on the show Escape from New York came right after this, right? right? Yeah. And then the thing and stuff. Sure. All of that has come after. So, so this, this is, is right about the Halloween days, right? Yeah. When he was directing the first Halloween, but not directing the second one, right? Uh, writing and producing yeah. and stuff on that, um, sandwich kind of right in between there. And the, uh, the definite way to tell that is probably from your cast of characters yeah, that shows it's pretty up. Pretty obvious. Um, you know, you have. Jamie Lee Curtis as mm-hmm. Elizabeth. I cannot get enough young, awesome Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. I guess Jamie Lee Curtis in, in general, because we saw her in H2O, right. and she's fucking she's fantastic in that, in that. But when Jamie Lee Curtis was pretending to be a scream queen for a very brief period, I mean, she had a she had an alright career doing that stuff. Yeah, like, she did. She could have gone on to do a bunch of these films, but when we think back to our scream queens, they don't always have four films under their belt. Right. Sometimes they do two or three films, and they serve their purpose in their uh, in their particular franchise and that's all you need think back to Nancy I right. mean that you just right. need to remember Nancy specifically from those movies and that man she just she fucking earned her rank right there and that's how I feel about Jamie Lee Curtis yeah I mean that Halloween stuff just fucking earned that and then of course also in Terror Train so yeah. you got a little bonus of some more Jamie right. Lee Curtis Prom Night too oh man Prom Night yeah so whatever I'm I'm gonna call Jamie Lee Curtis a Scream Queen is that alright yes like, have absolutely we, have I offended the slasher the queen gods of Scream Queens or, but there's some more cast in this yeah some cast that you love there is so Adrian Barbeau is in this yeah from Escape from, Escape New, York. from New York so from actually the other stuff. something I don't know you know but um around this time Adrian Barbeau was married to somebody who was involved with the making of this film uh oh um so Adrian Barbeau and John Carpenter got hooked up really yeah because I know he was involved with Deborah Hill, mm-hmm. who wrote some of the stuff, right. who wrote a lot of stuff right. with him. But she was married to John Carpenter, and I still think, even now, that she is the one of the hottest creatures to ever walk the planet. You know, every time you say that on the show, we get hate mail. That's fine. <laughs> Are you and aware Everybody's of that? fucking wrong, All so right. fuck you. So Adrian Barbeau is in this. We have Hal Holbrook, who plays the, the father, the priest. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tom Atkins is in it, who we saw in Halloween 3. The weird one. Right. Halloween the, 3, the weird one, not Tom I mean, Atkins, the weird one. <laughs> well. Debatable. Right. You're forgetting a huge one, The Fog. Oh, right. Which is not actually an actor in this well, film. Well, maybe. I mean. Yeah, I'm, I, we'll talk about The Fog. We'll get to The Fog. I'm saving all of my environmental fog conversation because that's something I still don't know how I feel about it. And maybe if I just talk about actors some more in my Great. head, I can collect my thoughts. Fantastic. One of my favorite things about the movie, unfortunately, is right in the beginning. It happens right in the first instance of the movie. It And it's kind of this joke. I mean, if you'll remember way back when, uh, to the, the early, early days of the show, the only reason I've even seen horror films is because we started this goddamn podcast. Right. Uh, having not started this, I would not have seen any of this stuff. I would be completely unaware of slasher stuff. I wouldn't have seen John Carpenter stuff. Although, you know, I think he operates outside horror, too. Yeah. I think if you look at Big Trouble in Little China and The Thing, Mm -hmm. uh, both of those are kind of, I mean, they have horror elements to them, certainly, but they're not as horror as, say, something like Halloween. Well, Escape from New York, I think, is one of the most outside horror films. So he does, uh, I wouldn't even necessarily call them sci-fi so much as maybe fantasy. You know, something like Escape from, uh, sorry, not Escape from New York, that kind of has the the sci-fi stuff, but Big Trouble in Little China. Almost seems like, I mean, there's a sand beetle. It's, yeah, right. there, there we're talking a about a fantasy There's a film. floating eyeball. It's just, you can't say fantasy and also there's Kurt Russell. Well, as soon as Kurt Russell steps in, the movie just has too much balls to mm-hmm. be a uh, fantasy film. Okay, so we start on this. My, my point, what I was getting back to, is that I've had this crash course in John Carpenter and I've learned a few key things about yeah. Mr. Okay, Carpenter's good. films. So let, let, let me hear them. And the uh, the opening of the movie almost seems to be a joke about John Carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that we always touch on, so I won't dwell on it, but John Carpenter movies are very paced. And almost without exception, you have to let the movie sit in your mind. Yep. Just let it kind of simmer there for like a good week after you see it to know if you enjoyed the film. Which isn't the case probably, right? I mean, you know if you enjoyed right. the film as sure. you're watching it. But something like Escape from New York gets better every time yeah. you watch it. Uh, you watch it, and a week later you go, you know, that was 
as I remember the movie in my mind, it was probably better than I th- seemed to think right, at the time, exactly. which is wrong, right? right. <laughs> which, I mean, if you're watching a movie and you go, yeah, okay, a week later to tell yourself it was better than you remember as you were watching it is probably incorrect. But then you watch it again and again and again, and it just gets fucking better every yeah. time. It's part of this, it's almost a paranormal, a supernatural ability that these films have. And The Fog is no exception Absolutely to not. But in being paced... The movies tend to be slow. Very and slow. To the point now where we actually snicker when there's action that happens too early in the film. Yeah. It's right? like, hey, film, settle down. Right. Well, You're we not were, supposed to get to that we yet. Were, we were having a blast in the in the initial ghost mischief. Yes. <laughs> when the horns were blaring and the gas came off the meter yeah, and it was right. running up a large bill. Yes. And I'm, I mean, we're thinking, oh, my God, John Carpenter, slow down. What is this, a Michael Bay movie? Yeah, right. The joke I'm getting back to, though, is that it starts on a pocket watch. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's this thing about John Carpenter who makes short movies, but, and I mean, they're all pretty short. They are. But they all seem like they're about two and a half hours mm-hmm. long. They all seem ridiculously long. And so it opens on this watch almost as if to say, no, really, you've only been here 20 seconds. Right. You know? <laughs> You're like, Man, the scene's been going on for eight and a half minutes. And you look at the pocket watch, and no, it's really, it's been about 35 seconds. Mm-hmm. You just... You just feel like it's so much longer. Uh, you open on this campfire story that seems to have nothing to do with the rest of the film. I would say it kind of opens up the tone of, uh, you know, spooky ghost story camp. Oh, that just sounds like something John Carpenter wants me to say. Right. That's not something I actually exactly. Think. It's as if he's saying, oh, really, you guys, this is like a good ghost story. Uh, the way M. Night Shyamalan talks about uh, his movies being bedtime story. Mm-hmm. What was that lady in the water right. that in all the press yeah. he kept saying, it's like a bedtime story. Yeah. So you're supposed to view it in this light other than what the the film actually does. Well, what I really enjoy about the scene where it's the campfire and the ghost story, that whole thing, is John Carpenter isn't entirely notorious for doing supernatural flicks. No, no, Especially this early in his career. What We've seen Halloween, completely mm-hmm. not supernatural. Yeah, natural. Dark Star, sci-fi. Yeah. And then Assault on Precinct 13 is about a shooting in a town. I yeah. mean, this is not... Even Escape from New York, well, you know, Escape to look New at York, this stuff the, later. The Thing, none yeah, of these things... The I Thing mean, is a monster film. It's not really a supernatural there's no, film. We're talking so. ghosts. We're talking yeah. afterlife bullshit. Right. And it's not until we get to Mars later in his career. Exactly. That it's this weird thing where he goes, okay, this is a ghost or he acknowledges, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it feels like an acknowledgement that, you know, this is, these are ghosts. This is, this is kind of outside of the realm of familiarity. Yeah. This is something. Or of reality. Well, more yeah, specifically. exactly. I'm familiar with reality. So in being a movie about fog, of course it has to rely on atmosphere. A part of what's always an easy cheat for atmosphere for me is radio personality. Yeah. DJ radio personality. Who, by the way, in an incredible business decision, also runs the lighthouse. Perfect. Because what are you doing when you run a lighthouse? You're not fucking doing anything. You're just hanging out in the lighthouse. You might as well, you know, get some mics together and do a goddamn podcast. I mean, come on. So this is a weird role because she's sort of the protagonist, but sort of not. Right. She kind of splits time with the couple, you know, well, and she, with uh, uh, Jimmy Lee Curtis's character. It's kind of like a Super Soul Kowalski thing. Yeah. You have her kind of as the lookout for the entire town, kind sure. of kind of letting the audience know here's what's coming and then you have the characters that are experiencing it yeah and she's kind of safe and high up and far away and removed from everything but at the same time that makes her powerless to help her own child and her nanny and all these other people in town all she can do you know all she can do is stand by and watch and hope that they're listening yeah yeah listening for the fog because of course the fog makes an audible sound that mm-hmm. i believe is a radio shack keyboard from the late yeah. 70s oh john carpenter i love your musical scores so here's the thing about the fog right i mean i don't actually have a beef with the character of the fog right. but i was really excited going into this movie because i wanted to know how they were going to make the fog a villain right i just keep thinking we already tagged uh, m night Shyamalan in this podcast mm-hmm. so i might as well talk about it again but we need to find a way to shove the disastrous the happening right. onto the show because I am just so amazed at how it's almost as if a grand amount of talent and energy went into making the film that bad mm-hmm. because it is so horrendous. Even years now after it's come out, I still imagine back to it as being that horrendous. But that's a movie where really nothing, nothing is happens. the antagonist. Nothing's the bad guy. Uh, you know, we it's, kind of, story. it's kind of the plan. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, it's kind of the plants. It's kind of the air. It's the event that is the. It's the uh, event, the and it's something. It's something in science that we'll really never know or be able to explain. Oh God! 
can we all right so just talk to me about this right now just very briefly uh previously i've made you do bad things on the show before you know we did theodore rex and you had a rough time with that can we wedge the happening on here somewhere yeah because i just feel like that it's short and it's ridiculously comical i can think of a few things we could pair it with all right all right so uh to get away from that though i was excited okay the fog as a villain how the fuck are they going to do that it's got to be something crazy and ridiculous and awesome and hilarious it's got to be just something that will amuse me even if just from a production standpoint and the way they make the fog a villain is that it's really just the pretense for ghosts showing up. Right. It's just a warning sign. But they it's can, not actually well, the it's, enemy. It's almost a warning sign. They can't travel outside the fog. Yeah, it's what they so, use to travel, I guess. So, I mean, that's in there. And there's these, so there's these leper pirates, essentially, yes. yeah. who commit these horrendously violent acts of murder. I Unnecessarily mean, they violent gouge acts. people's They don't eyes. have to be it's that mean. It's fantastic. And that's one of the things I love about the film. But you're right. I mean, it. The, the I want t- the fog to be the I want villain. people to choke or yeah. to like get squished by the fog or right. something. Right. I just want them to be terrorized looking at the fog and then trying to to escape from the I I just keep going back to the happening when Mark Wahlberg talks to the plant. I mean, I, it just seems like that. But with the mastery and the uh the seriousness of something that John Carpenter would do. But yeah, we get the ghost and there's still something humorous about the fact that so this event, I mean, they're celebrating their um, centennial, right. right? The hundred years of this town existing or being founded or whatever. And when we find out what originally happened and right. what the uh, ghost pirates or perhaps pirate ghosts are getting revenge for, it's because they were killed. Uh, they had leprosy. Yeah. And they were sent here, I guess, as part of this export your leprosy project right. to kind sure. of, you know, send them away to live in their own colonies. I don't want to say they were the town was justified in killing them, but they kind of make it out like it's greed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also they didn't want leprosy, right? I mean, isn't that yeah. isn't that a that's an okay reason? To, I think it's an, well, it's an okay reason to turn them away. Yeah, it's not an okay reason to kill them off to trick them into yeah. so <laughs> busting there, their ship up. So and, there's these six conspirators that essentially come yeah. up with the idea: let's kill these lepers and we'll take their gold and oh man that scene too when we get the the piece of driftwood right it's like a, a pirate coin and yeah. then it turns into driftwood so when our lovely dj protagonist has a piece of driftwood you know she's playing the uh, radio promotions the commercials mm-hmm. and stuff and the piece of driftwood starts dripping water and then the water drips into the radio and you get this horrifying message that comes out over the radio. Yeah. Well, and, and the driftwood says six, six must, must die. die and then yeah. bursts into sparking flame. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for no reason at all. Uh, but it is kind of terrifying when you get that message, that recording. There's something really fucked up about that. I guess the other thing about the fog is I'm not sure I'm afraid of it. Right. I mean, it's got pirates in it. I, I just don't know. You know, when the, when the fog pours through the door, it's just so obviously a smoke machine. Right. I feel like right. I'm bump into the club i just don't know if uh well and the other thing is we run into the same similarity with that we did in tremors where the count is just too fucking low yeah six people need to die <laughs> six in a town full die. of people and furthermore six people need to die and you don't find this out until three people in yeah they're already dead so you go well we're we're half over with the killing it can't get any worse than this there's, this there's three more people that need to die yeah and by the end you get this one of my favorite things in the film where um the priest who's a d- direct descendant of the sixth conspirator yeah. hands over the golden cross and then the fog disappears and goes back as quickly as it came. Yeah. Uh, but then the fucking ghosts come back and yeah. kill him. The fog reappears. In the no last reason. scene, it just yeah, fucking yeah. kills him. Yeah. I'm guessing that might be part of the, um, the reshoots. Uh, the fog had, I think it was a third of the total film was shot after the movie was wrapped because wow. John Carpenter decided he wasn't happy with it. So he went back and shot an additional third that he kind of kind of fucked with the movie and re-edited it together. Um, maybe with the fog, I just need to be reminded of the danger because I forget that I'm supposed to be terrified of the fog. Right. You know, it leaks through the door and I, I just start thinking. There's a point where it's it's coming out of a machine or they're around machinery and I forget yeah. that I'm looking at the fog. I just think there's some steam coming out of the machine. Right. What could you do to make the fog scarier? Well, I guess you could get, make it, give it sounds. You could have it kill pets. Yeah, that's true. I think fog killing pets is the way to go. Okay. There's one scene where it's going through the town at a, at a rapid John Carpenter pace. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a dog barking. And I I always just kind of wish, you know, if it, if it were made in 2010. Yeah. 
that would you would hear the dog barking and then you'd not hear, in 2005 though you'd hear the dog whimper yes and then no more dog barking and you yeah. realize oh here comes this violent apparition if the fog would start choking people to death if it didn't have a set body count of six perhaps yeah i think if the fog dissolved people like acid you know as if you couldn't touch the fog if it touched you it would just melt away your body that would be pretty that's a really great idea and then i'm impressed all right we should write some of these down and get to work on this i do think the end shot with the pirates is kind of scary i think you have that it's just a great method to silhouette your monster like that so it's too dark to see that these guys are just extras poorly dressed as mm-hmm. pirates with red red lights in their yeah. face <laughs> yeah red lights taped over their eyelids uh who actually can't see anything because they have red lights taped over their eyelids they're stumbling around it's not the leprosy it's the props that are making the pirates <laughs> right. limp like that if we got more of the scary silhouettes of the yeah i mean uh, some of the fog stuff is really freaky you know when you have uh the light behind the fog silhouetting yeah. stuff I mean, that all makes for really great, very atmospheric effects. I guess I just need more eminent danger, yeah. more danger coming from the fog. More than, well, the weather's going to be kind of nasty out, and you might get slashed by a ghost pirate if you're one of the six conspirators. Now sports. Not sports, but the end of Double Feature, okay, or this episode. Not the end of that. Man, that sounded so... For a second there, everyone just cried out in terror. No, we got a whole fucking year left before we can start scaring people with the end of the show when we mean the year end finale before next year. Uh, so now that everyone is terrified, see how I did that right yeah, off of wow. the fog? Everyone is scared now. Ooh. Go to the website and send us an email. Send us an email about you, how you don't want the show to end. Can we just arbitrarily scare people that yeah. our show is going to, you know what guys, we're just closing up shop this here. This is at Double potentially Feature. the last episode of Double Feature. <laughs> yeah, right. We could die before next week. There's a very real possibility of that. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. So you can go on the website and find our previous John Carpenter stuff. You would think you could find it by just typing John Carpenter into the search. But when I built the website, I was not as smart as I am now. Do you like how I just turned my mistake into a backhanded compliment? That was really smooth. Uh, yeah, I was stupid and I didn't, I didn't put that together. But what you can do is just look up the thing or look up Big Trouble in Little China. Have we only done, and, and Halloween, I guess, but have we only done three John Carpenter movies? Escape that from New York, right. Escape from L.A. Oh, yeah, okay. So all of the other John Carpenter movies as well. Um, look that stuff up. And then there's also the Killapaloozas in there, and nothing that's going to relate to Tremors. If you like Tremors, then I don't know what you should look for on the website, because there's really nothing else. I'm sorry. All right, we have an email address as well. It's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can send us a little feedback through that. Uh, Let us know what's on your mind. We have finalized what we're doing with donations. So here's the plan. Since nobody learned from the experiment of JCVD and Bronson, we're still getting these requests every day. Oh, I have a great idea for a double feature. You want to do it on the show. Here's what it is. What we've decided to do is try this fucking thing out one more time. We're going to take everybody who donated and essentially put them in a raffle. So Jonathan's going in, everybody whose name we've been mentioning during year three who donated, and everybody who donates from now until the end of the year. And everybody's going in a raffle. We're going to pick two winners. Each of the winners is going to submit a short list of single films they would like us to do. And then we are going to try and find one film on each person's list that goes with the other and do that as a double feature toward the end of the year. We're going to give a whole show to it. So no matter how many times you uh, donate, you get entered into that once. And that's our subscribers as well. Everybody who's donating gets entered into that raffle. We're going to do something a little different for the people who subscribe in addition to that. Because uh, we didn't think it'd be fair if they just got entered into the raffle every fucking month. Because then they would totally win. But also they're subscribing and that gives us lots of money and allows us to keep doing the show the way we want. So for those people... We're going to basically take everybody who subscribes. They send that automatic $5 donation every month through the website. At the end of the year, we're going to take all the vocal clips out of our intro, our little theme. And we are going to uh, edit in clips from the people who subscribe. So you'll basically be able to submit an MP3. You can record it on your own. Or we're going to set up a voicemail number at the end of the year. And you can call in. You don't have to use the same clip from the show. You can basically say anything you want that fits into the theme. And we're going to edit all those together into a theme for the last episode or one of the last episodes. Actually, depending on how many subscribers we have, we might do a couple episodes worth of themes that are completely made uh, with vocal clips from the listeners. Both of these sound like wonderful fucking disasters, and I can't wait. So it's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Go head over and check that out. 
Also, I assume, because we've been doing this every week for three fucking years, that we're going to do another episode next week. So what are the mm. what are the movies that we're doing? We're going to do Lord of War and Thank You for Smoking. Uh, why do these movies go together? Is this double feature going to work? Yeah, or? you know, I think it will. Yeah. I'm inclined to believe... Well, we have that like kind of hotshot leader protagonist yeah. thing. Yeah, all right, that's going Talking on. about devil's advocate stuff. Okay. You, you and I like guns. You <laughs> and I like smokers' rights. Still don't smoke. I don't smoke. Do you smoke? No. Don't drink. You doing any drinking these Not days? Not drinking either. Watch more fucking film. Bye. That's a weird ending. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan donated. I don't know if I made that clear. We got a donation from Jonathan this week, and I remember I was doing the thing, and it was just like, you'll get entered in, you'll get entered in, Jonathan will get entered in, and it probably didn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> oh, what a professional show we run here.